Hello, my name is Simon Benjamin, and this is the fourth of my lectures on Fourier series, including Fourier transforms and partial differential equations. Now, in this lecture, which I've been really looking forward to, um, it's Fourier transform time. We've had three lectures all about Fourier series, various aspects of them, uh, and in the last lecture we finished up by the complex form of the Fourier series, and that was so that we could spend this whole lecture talking about Fourier transforms which is an incredibly powerful and important area. So, specifically, what we're going to do is recap Fourier series, just briefly, and then we'll motivate the upgrade from Fourier series to Fourier transforms. And then, of course, we'll do that upgrade and we'll do an example. We'll perform the Fourier transform for an interesting uh, function. Then we'll spend a bit of time uh, thinking about uh, broader properties and uses of the Fourier transform. Uh, including some mentions from uh, maybe some um, areas of physics that you might find pretty interesting. And then I want to uh, go further still and do uh, almost um, an example of using the Fourier transform that you could really just put to use straight away if you wanted to uh, in terms of processing audio recordings. All right, so that's going to be the lecture. And as always, the notes for this course are, are available to everyone as PDFs and um, you can find them at simonb.info. That said, this lecture, in the notes, it's just the, the core of it. So it's really about how to do the upgrade and working through an example. And a lot of the rest of the stuff I'm going to say in terms of like getting the intuition and seeing some applications, that's not in the notes, that's only in the lecture, unusually. All right, let's begin. So here on this screen, I've summarized uh, Fourier series as we've come to know and love them in the last few lectures. So at the top here is the form of Fourier series that we spent the most time with, uh, which is um, where we express a function in a series as a series of building block functions added together. And those building blocks are just signs and causes, and they have um, an integer uh, frequency um, compared to the, the basic sine and cos. So we have sine of cos of x or of 2x or 3x or of 4x. And for each of those possibilities, we have some coefficient, which we write either a n or b n. And those coefficients, um, we know how to figure out. That's what we did in the first lecture. Uh, we deduced that a n and b n must be given by these integrals. So that was the Fourier series written in terms of sines and cosses. And then uh, at the end of the last lecture, we went ahead and translated that um, into our uh, complex form, we simply substituted the signs and causes for their complex um, exponential notation alternatives, and then just tidied up the, the sum and the integral things into the new form. So that looks less intuitive, I know, um, or at least to most people I think it will. Uh, it is, we have to admit, a very compact expression, clearly the, the stuff written in the green box is less stuff than the stuff written in the blue box. Um, but it's it, the crucial thing to remember is it's the same thing. You can go from the green box, box to the blue box or from the blue box to the green box. They are equivalent uh, statements. So I hope not too disturbing to have gone from the sine cos form into the complex form. But now, what can we say about getting beyond more, a more profound change, for sure? which is to go beyond the Fourier series to the Fourier transform. I'd like to start by motivating that for you by having a little bit of an investigation of how some Fourier series change as we alter the period of the function. And from that, we'll whip over to Mathematica. Right, we're actually not over in Mathematica because I went over there, generated these uh, diagrams, and then I realized I wanted to be able to write on them, so I've pasted an image into my drawing program. So what have we got here? We've got uh, a grid of uh, six um, graphs. Now on the top row here, um, what we have is the actual um, Fourier series that we get with a truncated Fourier series. So this is our f of x, and uh, it's truncated. Um, I've actually truncated it to, I think, maximum n equals 19 as the um, highest uh, sine or cos index that I'll have there. And we can see that over on the case of the square wave, um, that has led to these um, still quite visible, quite prominent 
um, overshoots, this Gibbs phenomenon thing that we were talking about. That's fine. So that's the reconstructed periodic function itself. What I have on the middle row here is just, uh, so in this uh, column here, I'm showing the components that go together to make the function above. So if you take all these things and add them up, and you take all the, on the other side all those ones and add them up, then what you end up with is the function above. Those are literally with, you know, with the correct uh, frequency and also the correct amplitude, the correct weighting, those are the components. Where you see that there's a, a straight line there, like that one I've just put a dot on, that uh, reminds you that um, cos 2 of x, or this is the sign on the, the uh, square wave is made out of uh, sine terms, as you may remember. So then sine 2 of x and sine 4 of x and sine 6 of x are all, their amplitudes are all zero. We don't use any of them when we build this uh, basic square wave. And similarly, for the triangular wave, which is made out of coses, we again don't have any of those even uh, um, frequencies. So that's fine. So I, I hope from the previous lectures this kind of makes sense. Those are the components that go in. And then on the bottom I've just drawn um, or I've graphed out um, a series of points that actually the connective lines like that one there are um, just Mathematica joining up the points for us as a guide to the eye. But there, there really aren't lines there, they're just points. It's a series of numbers and those numbers are of course just the weights. So these are the uh, the bn coefficients of our sine terms, and these are the an on the other side, the an coefficients of our cos terms um, that go into those particular functions. So th I'm showing you this as a warm-up exercise, because you've seen this before, not quite in this form. But I wanted you to see that, to understand the language I'm using, the graphical language, and now I want to show you something new. This is the same thing, but for different functions. A uh, function that we haven't analyzed as part of these lectures, but you could analyze it, it's nothing uh, too strange. Um, it's simply a triangular wave and then a region of zero before we repeat. So here, uh, the repeat point on this um, uh, example over on, on the right is about there. I actually can't even remember what I set the periodicity to be, but um, it's sort of from there to there, if you want to think of it that way. Um, and then a cycle repeats now. Importantly, the width of the triangular tooth, so to speak, is just one um, in both these diagrams. Uh, so it looks narrower over here on the other side, but that's just because it's plotted on a wider x-axis. So that width is one, and the height, uh, for what it's worth, is also one. So what I'm saying is, the uh, triangular teeth are exactly the same in these two diagrams. What's different is the distance between them, how far we go before we repeat. So this distance here, I'm <laughs> cluttering my diagrams with lots of uh, lines, is less than this distance here. The one on the right is further. So if we call this, um, well, the complete uh, distance from the middle of one to the middle of the next, uh, we call that L1 for the one on the left, call it L2 for the one on the right. And so the only difference between these two functions is that L2 is more than L1. And you can see roughly by how much more, sort of 50% more or something. So now, um, what does that, what consequences does that have? So if we come down to the middle row of our diagram, we can see that um, we need a broader range of frequencies by the look of it in order to build the object on the right. So this, where I'm drawing the arrow, goes a bit further down. And that's what we might expect, I suppose, because in our previous experience of playing with the sine and cos, and here again we saw that dramatically, so the, the square wave needed a lot more frequencies, or, okay, there's an infinite sum in both cases, but the frequency, the higher frequencies had more weight for the square wave because that is further from being a simple um, cos or sine. Uh, the triangular, of course, is also not a cos or sine, but it's closer. And in the same sort of uh, intuitive reasoning, we might expect that the further apart we move these spikes, the more uh, complex they become, or rather the further they, be they are from being a simple oscillatory function like a sine or a cos. So it needs more frequencies in order to build it. That would be a very rough intuition. Now, what I really want to draw your attention to is these curves at the bottom. Maybe I'll change color. 
So we see here, again, just the individual weights, uh, the line that's, drawing, that's joining them up, that I'm uh, uh, drawing your attention to, is just Mathematica joining up a series of discrete points. But when we do that, when we join these points up, we notice something, which is that these two functions kind of look similar to each other, except the one on the right is sort of more stretched out. But they both have the property that they curve down to zero and then have a slight recovery, a sort of ripple. And in fact, if we were to zoom in, we'd see there's even, uh, I'll show you where with this arrow, there's even another ever so slight um, increase again in the amplitude as we ask how much of each increasing frequency do we want. Now, when a uh, someone who's used to using maths for modeling things or a mathematician sees this kind of thing, you're dealing with two related problems because the only difference between these, I remind you, is, is how far you have to get through the zero region before you're allowed to have another one of these triangular teeth. Um, so closely related problems and the uh, graphs look, or the graphs of the weights look similar to the eye. Now, and what that makes you wonder as a mathematician, or someone using maths, is are they actually the same? Are they the same function and just stretched? Or are they actually just a bit different? Um, even if we were to scale them to try and fit the two, these two on top of each other, um, would they lie perfectly on top of each other, which would then be trying to tell us something? Then that shape must mean something because it somehow isn't changing as we change the problem. Or are they actually just slightly different curves and sort of just optical coincidence that they have some characteristics in common? How would we answer that? Well, we would scale them and put them on top of each other if we wanted to continue to look at it numerically, that is, with the help of a computer. Of course, we can also go over to the maths, which we'll do in a bit, and, and figure it out from that end. But coming on the idea of scaling things, how would we scale it? What would be the right way? Well, we could just, uh, I could literally go back to Mathematica and make it so that I can drag one on top of the other and, and scale. But that would be very uh, hand-wavy kind of, uh, you know, trial and error approach. We should be able to do better than that. And to do better than that, what we need to do is think about what the x-axis in these two diagrams really is. Uh, yes, it's, it's the number n that appears in uh, a term of either, um, actually these are all causes by the way, because the function at the top there, uh, <laughs> I've already drawn on it so heavily, let me draw one more time. As you can see, the basic object there is symmetric um, on the y-axis and then it's just mirrored. So this is just, it, and it's an even function, so it's made out of causes. Mm -hmm. But my question is, what is that horizontal axis really? Yes, it's the integer n, but can we have a more intuitive picture of what it is? Let's go back to the expression for it and see. So here I've gone back to our equations and I've put on in purple the thing I want to focus on, which is that because I was plotting there functions that have some uh, period, period L that is not 2 pi. In fact, I was altering that period, so comparing uh, different values of the periodicity. Then I was using this substitution here, which we met uh, a lecture or two ago, where we see that if we replace n with 2 pi over l times n, then we can describe a function of any periodicity we like, because when x moves through a, dist a change of l, then um, what cos sees is something that has moved through a change of 2 pi, because of this 2 pi over l factor. And so that is what we should really be plotting. If we want to compare two different uh, situations with different periodicities, we should account for that. What they have in common is that we can ask what is this, this term, which is, by the way, a frequency. Um, that is, if you have cos of something times x, that something is a frequency. It's a spatial frequency. It tells you how far you have to go before you repeat the function. Or if we were looking at, uh, instead of x, our variable x, if we were using t, because we were analyzing something that varies over time and building a Fourier series, for it, then of course, it would be a temporal frequency. Um, but either way, it's a frequency. It's a frequency times 2 pi. That's okay, an angular frequency. Um, but th that is a clearly a physically meaningful thing, and it, it allows us to then compare two different situations. We can say, well, let's look at the 
frequencies that they contain. So that's, long story short, what we want to do is uh, rather than plotting our graphs there against n, we should plot them against n divided by l. Optionally multiplied by 2 pi, that wouldn't make any difference because it will affect them both the same, but crucially, we scale by l. Let's see what happens when we do that. Okay, there at the bottom, I've pasted in the result of scaling by exactly a factor of 1 over l, and then putting the two diagrams above on top of each other. To be clear, the orange points come from that side, and the blue points, let me change to blue, um, come from that side. They, they, um, so the orange ones have, have been uh, scaled by more, of course, because L2 is the, is the larger of the two periods. But the point is that now they seem to lie pretty much perfectly on top of each other. It seems that uh, our waiting for our um, Fourier series is described by some underlying function and that when we want to get the values for a particular period, a particular value L, we just need to sample at regular intervals, and that interval is, is you know, described by uh, 1 over L, so uh, it gets denser. We need to sample more often if we are asking for a longer period, so hence the orange dots are closer together, but they still lie on the same function. What does that mean? Uh, in order to think about that, we might say, well, what, if, what, what happens if we continue this progression? We started from a certain separation um, between a certain periodicity, and then we considered a larger one. And what would happen if we kept going? If we now tried a larger and a larger and a larger separation, uh, we could go and do that in Mathematica, but it would take a while, so I'll just tell you what would happen. I'll put on some purple dots to show you. If we went to a much larger separation, we would get this. Uh, sorry, there's a pink, that's all right. Pink dots. And so we would see a very dense uh, range of dots, but again, they would follow the same underlying function. And they would keep going. By the way, the, the reason that there aren't more orange dots on here is because we stopped at n equals 19 when generating these things. But of course, the, really, they go on forever. So whichever um, separation we chose, we would end up plotting out the entire curve as a series of dots. Now, here's my question. What happens as we go to infinitely large separation? So as L, uh, what color are we not using? Purple, so down here. As L goes to infinity, what would we expect then? Well, what we would expect if this example of just two cases is continued, is that those points that are the, the particular weights we need against frequency would come infinitely close together. They would essentially form a continuous line, but still lie on the function. In other words, that underlying curve would be uh, completely created through a, a continuous series of points. And what would a Fourier series be if the period were infinite. Well, it's no longer periodic in that case. We would have uh, broken free of our rule that we can only model periodic functions or functions uh, which you know are only defined in a finite range, and then we make them periodic. But that's still a kind of periodic function, just an extra step. But here, if we make the distance between one cycle and next infinity, that's, that's a non-periodic function, because it means we get to define the full uh, you know, range of our function it sounds strange to say it, but a periodic function with period infinity is, is not periodic, essentially. We've broken free. So it seems that somehow this curve, this characteristic curve, which come, oh, I'll do it this way around, comes down and has its ripples, is telling us about something more than a Fourier series, a Fourier series that's broken free of being periodic. And that's what we now want to investigate. Before we can do that, well, we're going to do that using the complex Fourier series, just because that's going to give us the notation that's the conventional one. But this little analysis here, uh, both for the, um, the, the reminder in terms of the square wave and triangular wave, and these new triangular occasional tooth functions, have all been done in times of sine and cos. And so um, these uh, plots made of dots are the a, n, and b, n coefficients. Uh, just the a n actually here because it's just the uh, the cos function that was needed. What would it? What would we see if we had repeated this analysis, this little investigation, and we had instead 
use the complex Fourier series? Well, um, that's actually super easy to answer. It, you already made a note of it, but I'll write it here again. If you want to get the C numbers, which have either a positive or negative index n, if, you're, if you could have written the Fourier series as a sum of cos terms, which is the case here, then it's just the A, just make the magnitude of n divided by 2. So that's, that's, those are the complex coefficients that we would need. And if we did a graph of those, well, we can see what, what we're saying here is that um, instead of the function that we have at the bottom, let me tidy it up because I've kind of drawn on it so much. <laughs> instead of just that, we would have now have a function that's half the height because of the factor of 1 over 2. Um, but has exactly the same shape in other respects, so it will still have these little ripples, but it will have half the height. I've somehow managed to draw it so badly that it looks like it has more. <laughs> Try one more. Uh, it's pretty difficult to draw, so in that tiny space it has half the height. And then, uh, crucially, it's mirrored, right, because um, we can now have these negative values, but they must just be um, the same the same value in each case so we had some value here and that would be the same over here so once again my drawing skills are not quite what i would wish them to be but i hope that you can get the idea that what i've tried to draw on here with the purple line the new purple line is um something that has half the the height of the previous function and is mirrored so it has the same uh, you know the whatever you have on the horizontal axis our frequency, if we allow that to go negative, as we do for our complex series, it's just the mirror image. That's the thing that I would like to, um, or I hope, will come out of our analysis. When we look at the complex Fourier series, we ask what happens when the periodicity goes to infinity, and then we actually plug in this specific example. So let's do that now. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the complex form of the Fourier series and just explore the idea of making uh, the period of it become infinite. So the first thing we'll need to do is to take uh, what's written in the green box here and then write it in the form where we, indeed we make the period explicit so that it isn't locked to being 2 pi, but we know how to do that. So let's just quickly write that out. So there I've written it out in orange, uh, our generalized version what are we doing? We're just sticking in our little uh, factors here that allow us to go for a function that doesn't have uh, period 2 pi. Note the limits of the integral are now over one complete cycle but written in terms of L and instead of 1 over 2 pi in front we have 1 over L. So let's uh, clean that up. Those are the differences and it's that form that I want to now explore as L becomes larger and larger. As the first step of our generalization, I'm going to introduce a new function. And its job is going to be to generate those C numbers for us whenever we want them, so that we no longer have to write them in uh, in the way we've been doing up till now. But let me just write out what this new function is and then we'll look at it. I'm going to use capital F uh, for the new function uh, because we're already using lowercase f for the original function. And more than that, um, to avoid confusion with x, I'm going to use a different variable, k. So uh, let me just write out what it is. All right, uh, what does it look like? It looks a lot like the um, line up immediately above that's generating our constant cn for us, but it is a little different. Um, now, uh, what I want to know is, what is cn written in terms of f? What do I have to do to f to generate one of my cn terms? Well, I can see that uh, I'm going to need to divide by L because my capital F function doesn't have that well 1 over L in front. So it's 1 over L times F what? So now I need to think what value of K should I feed in in order to get um, exactly, let's stop using orange, in order to get uh, exactly this expression here. Well, I can see that, in fact, uh, it's just that... Uh, business up inside the exponential that is the difference between the functions, that's where k appears. So k will need to be 2 pi n over l, and then they will match up. So let's put that in. f of 2 pi uh, um, n over l. So with that uh, relationship, my new function f will generate 
uh, any CN that I want, so I can use it instead. Fine, so let me rewrite, uh, so I don't want to do, take too many steps at once, so I'll rewrite uh, my complex Fourier series using this new function. You could think of it as a weighting function, because it, the job it's doing is to generate these weights for us whenever we want one. Uh, so let's write that out. So there we are tidying things up. Uh, that's just the complex Fourier series. The only difference is we're writing in our function capital F that uh, for, we're going to think of as the weighting function. It will generate for us those constants C subscript n um, when we feed in the appropriate frequency. But it's that's just a rewriting of things. We've done nothing substantial yet. But now it's time to think about what happens as the quantity L becomes larger and larger. And the big, well, actually, first let's think about what happens to our weighting function, because that's going to be easy. In the, um, uh, let's write, as L tends to infinity, okay, but if that's a bit of an awkward idea, just think of it becoming as large as you like, arbitrarily large, very large, then we can write that our F, k function, the one that gives us back the weights we need, well, it goes from L over 2, minus L over 2 to L over 2, but that's just going to be going from minus infinity to infinity, right? So that one is easy. Minus i, k, x, the rest of it, there's no change. Um, so it, it still just looks over one complete cycle, if you like. It's just that that cycle is now the entire possible range of x. So that's very easy, but of course the interesting part is to have a look at this sum over an infinite number of terms and do some work on that for the case that L is becoming larger and larger. The first thing is I want to uh, rewrite the sum just to emphasize that a different way of thinking about summing over the integers is that we are summing over the allowed values of the frequency. So I'll use the symbol k for that. And I'll say that we're summing over the allowed k is equal to 2 pi over L times n. And we understand that n is in any possible integer. So that's, that hasn't changed anything. It's just emphasized that to sum over the allowed in, uh, all integers is to sum over the allowed values of k defined like that. It's the same thing. But uh, that means that we can just write things a bit more compactly like this. That's quite nice. Now, the final thing I want to notice is how does k change as we go from one allowed value of k to the next? What's the increment? Well, as, as we go from n goes to n plus 1, that is the next allowed term, then k goes to uh, 2 pi over L times n plus 1, which is just uh, the original value of k plus 2 pi over L. So k goes up by 2 pi over L when we um, go when we hop from one allowed k to the next. That deserves its own symbol because the increment in the quantity is clearly important and let's call that delta k. It is a small quantity because L is, we are now understand, tending to be infinite large. It's a, arbitrarily large quantity, whereas 2 pi is just a constant. So this is a small quantity, and I notice that I've already got a 1 over L in my expression here. So that invites me to now write down the f of x expression in about the, um, the closest form to an integral that we can possibly get while still writing down a sum, and then we're going to take that final step. So um, I noted that 1 over L let me give myself uh, an extra factor of 2 pi so that where I had 1 over L, I can now write 2 pi over L and then replace that with delta K. So what will we get? We'll still have our, oops, we'll still, ooh, we'll still have our sum term over allowed K of uh, F of K, the weighting function, capital F of k, e to the i kx, delta k. Well, there we are. That is really suggestive of an integral, isn't it? We've got some quantity 
that, def that depends on a thing that we are sweeping over a range, um, in other words, the k quantity, the frequency quantity, we're multiplying it by a small amount, a small in interval in that k. So I don't think uh, you will be at all surprised if we now say, well, it's a very small step of the imagination to suggest that what we should have in the limit of uh, L becoming infinite is we have an integral now over the k quantity, e to the i k x, and now we write d, excuse me, dk. Um, and now what is the range of that integral? It's all the allowed k. What are the allowed k? They are from minus infinity to infinity. Um, that's all the possible frequencies, full frequency, the full frequency range. So there we are. That is now our Fourier series evolved into an integral form. Let's summarize what we've got. It's two very compact expressions, actually. So I will rewrite them. And there we are. So that, that is what we've figured out should be the evolved form of the Fourier series. We've got ourselves this thing we've called the weighting function. You feed the weighting function any frequency, and it tells you what the uh, amount, so to speak, um, of that frequency is that's needed in the combination. But the combination now is no longer a sum, but it's um, become a smooth integral because we're allowing all possible frequencies. And if we look at how this weighting function is defined, it's defined um, in a way that looks very similar to the, the two expressions, look very similar to each other. And this thing we've been calling the weighting function is in fact the Fourier transform. So say it one more time, the Fourier transform is really just a weighting function that tells us how much of each possible frequency we need to build the original function we're thinking of. Yes, um, it's a, a quite an elegant expression. We can see that the way we've written it, the only real differences between the two lines is that one of them has a 1 over 2 pi out in front, and where one of them is e to the plus i x, the other is e to the minus, excuse me, plus k x, the other one is e to the minus k x. But of course they are integrating over different things. The first expression, which is our new, uh, our way to break up the um, original function, this is sweeping over the allowed frequencies, which is all frequencies. Um, and the second entity, the weighting function, the Fourier transform, is obtained by sweeping over the x parameter, so inspecting the full width of the original function. So a very nice complementary set of two expressions there. I should just quickly say that there are other ways, other conventions that are a little bit different. I'll write them out just so that you've seen them. So that one in lime green is exactly the same expression. It's just using different symbols. But of course, these are just dummy symbols in the sense that they appear on both sides. You could use a smiley face if you like that symbol. But the reason uh, to highlight it is because when we are working with a Fourier, an original function, which is something changing in time, except instead of something changing over a, a range of space, then it's conventional, of course, to use t as the index for time and to use omega as the frequency, which is now a temporal frequency instead of a spatial frequency. It's actually the angular frequency if you want to get technical because it's got that 2 pi in it. So that one is a trivial re-expression. Those are clearly the, the, the expressions in purple, in the purple box, and those in the line box are obviously the same because they have exactly the same structure. They're just using different symbols. But they are the conventional choices for uh, a spatial analysis and a temporal analysis. And then something, I've just got enough room probably to write it in the top corner. Let me write it for you. There we are. I've wedged it up into the top corner. Uh, it's perhaps slightly more mm, the mathematician's way to write the Fourier transform. Uh, a couple of things to note that uh, we're writing the Fourier transform instead of a capital F as an F with a hat on it. That's the Fourier transform function. And although it's again just a dummy variable, so you could use anything you want, often in this representation, this squiggly E that I'm not, to be honest with you, very good at writing out, which is the Greek letter uh, tsai, 
Tsai. It's even quite hard for me to say. <laughs> but anyway, this messy squiggle symbol is um, is the one that represents the frequency. But the important point is that uh, we've pulled out a 2 pi inside the definition here. And the consequence of that is that we no longer have the 1 over 2 pi. Now, with all that said, let's go back to our Mathematica mystery and ask what was that thing that we seem to be converging to in our numerical experiments? Can we now obtain that curve and, and what will it be? So what that means is we need to now do a Fourier transform for the case we were looking at, which was, if you recall, a... Uh, let's draw it here. This was the function we were playing with, right? Except in the examples in Mathematica, it did recur with some periodicity, but now we are interested in the case where that L, that um, overall period, goes to infinity. So we're only going to get one of our triangular wave teeth. It goes from minus a half to plus a half, and it's simply a uh, straight line up to its peak at one and back down again. That is what we now need to analyze. So what we want to do is we, let's uh, choose the appropriate one. I would I guess we're going to use this definition. So this is going to be our Fourier transform. We want this for this particular case. Now, how could we uh, write out what f of x is equal to? Well, um, f of x here, we could say that the definition of it, if we want, is that it is going to be, uh, well, we're going to want some kind of trick like 1 minus the absolute value of x, except we know it should go to 0 at x is equal to a half. So what we want is 1 minus 2 times the absolute value of x, um, and that is understood to be, let's move it to make a bit more space, Uh, that is when the absolute value of x is uh, less than a half, or if you want less than or equal to a half, and it's equal to zero otherwise. Now that makes our Fourier uh, integral that we need to do to compute our Fourier transform uh, a bit nicer in the sense that we, we, we were integrating from minus infinity to infinity over x, but this function is zero, except in that finite range. So immediately we can say, well, all right, that's just going to be the integral from minus a half to a half. Of what? Well, of 1 minus 2 absolute value of x, and then e to the minus i k, where k is uh, going to be a constant for the purposes of this integ integral. And now we have to figure out how to do that. We might ask, is this an odd or an even function, because I like odd and even functions. Well, a nice thing to do at this stage, and there's a few ways we could go forward, but let's uh, let's say we don't really like complex numbers, so let's turn this into causes and signs and, and carry on that way. That's easy enough. So we no longer need our diagram for the time being. So that's just breaking up my complex exponential. Oh, and I uh, should have a... Uh, no, that's correct. <laughs> um, there's a minus sign, though, uh, which inside the cos makes no difference. So if I put in a minus there, I could immediately remove it because cos of minus something is equal to just cos of the positive version. But for sine, uh, the minus sign comes out through the sine function. And so what they'll end up doing is changing this plus to a minus. Has that helped? Well, yeah, because now I don't have to think about complex numbers anymore. And I can just look at these and see whether we've got odd or even functions. Now this first term this one here, the first integral, is an odd function, excuse me, is an even function multiplied by another even function. Good. Uh, that tells me that I can rewrite it as just the integral um, from 0 to the positive value of twice, I just double the integral. And that means since it's now x can only be positive or 0, I can drop that uh, absolute sign off of it, which makes it a much more standard integral. Now, how about what's going on over here with the sine? It's even better news, right? <laughs> because now this is an even function multiplied by an odd function. Even function multiplied by an odd function. That's an odd function. When we integrate an odd function between symmetric limits, either side of the origin, it's zero. So no more thinking required there. That term can just go away. Great.
So we're off to a flying start because we've reduced our Fourier transform problem to just working out a pretty straightforward integral. It's um, uh, going to, well, let's just finish it off. So the first one is just the integral of cos of some constant, so no worries there. It's going to give us two times, well, we'll need to make that cos. We'll integrate to sine, the positive sine uh, in front, so no problem, divided by k. Remember, k is just a constant for the purposes of these integrals. And then we have a little bit of more work to do. We've done this kind of thing before, though. Yeah, this is going to be an integration by parts, so I won't uh, labor the story. I'll just write it down. All right, so we're ready to basically finish this up. We're going to have our first expression here. Now, sine of 0 is 0, so only the upper limit here will potentially come to something non-zero. So that will give us sine of uh, half x, x over 2, divided by k, because uh, we subtract off a of 0. What's going on in the next, uh, stop the limits there, what's going on in our next expression? Well, we're going to have, uh, again, the zero to the part will vanish, now doubly so, because it's sine of zero and x is multiplying in there as well, so only the uh, value at a half is meaningful. So a similar expression of sine uh, k over 2 actually um, over 2k. But that is going to cancel with the first term, if I'm not mistaken. So then it's all down to the remaining term. Let's uh, multiply the, let's get rid of those curly brackets. And so we're going to need to put that factor of 4 in. And the minus become, two minuses become a plus. So 4 over k. And now we have this uh, final integral to do. Sine becomes cos, minus cos actually. Let's forget that sign again divided by k, and again at 0 and a half. So as I was saying, these first two terms actually cancel with each other. Um, that's convenient. So all we're left with, then, is 4 over k. Well, cos of uh, 0 is just uh, 1, so that's going to be... Uh, let's, so let's take the k out in front, so that's k squared. So we're going to get cos of x over 2, uh, sorry, x is a half, so cos of k over 2 minus 1, but the whole thing has a minus sign, so in fact I regret not having <laughs> it already done, never mind. Um, so we'll tidy it up, and what we're saying is that our Fourier transform, f of k, which is the weighting function where we feed in any spatial frequency we care about, and it tells us how much of that we should have, is going to be simply uh, 1 minus cos of the frequency divided by 2, the whole thing, divided by the frequency squared. I notice that that is... Oh, and I'm sorry, uh, there should be a factor of a 4. Mm, let's take it out in front, because it will look nicer that way, maybe. Move it over here would have been actually nicer in hindsight to have defined my triangular tooth from plus minus 1 to plus 1, and then we wouldn't have had these halves going through, but there we are, that's what I did. So this has not caused too much trouble. But there's our, uh, our answer. All right, let's find out if I've made a slip in the der derivation or if we've discovered the answer to our puzzle. What we're claiming is that that oscillatory dampening down function that we were numeric we were seeing coming out of the numerics is the uh, the weighting function the Fourier transform that we've just derived so let's see if it is if it if it matches or not so there we are that's that's um, 4 multiplied by 1 minus cos k over 2 divided by k squared and now we want to plot that so uh, we're saying let's plot our new function f of k, defined as above, from k, uh, let's do minus 5 to 5, see, oops, minus 5 to 5, see what we get. That's a limited range of frequencies. Of course, the function is defined from minus infinity to infinity, but let's just see what that shapes up to be. All right, that, um, let me just rescale that for you. Over here. 
that uh, is hard to tell because what we want is a function that damps down and oscillates and I simply haven't given it enough range to do that by the look of it. So we'll need to beef it up a bit. Let's go from minus 15 to 15, see what that looks like. That's encouraging, right? It's It's got that dip and recovery. Let's uh, stop mucking around and go to a really wide range here. Let's go from minus 40 to 40, see what the thing really looks like. And there it is. That certainly looks just like the function that we were sampling points along in our initial numerical investigation. And uh, spoilers, I can reveal that it is. So having obtained and checked that expression, um, let's just review now and make sure that we completely understand what we've done. We had this uh, little bit of a mystery as to why it is that when we considered Fourier series with different periodicity, um, the weights all uh, were on, a, on the same underlying curve. And that underlying curve was what we got when we made the x-axis in our diagrams not the integer n, but instead the frequency. Why was it that they all lined up on the same curve and that curve has turned out to be the Fourier transform? We can look back now at the key moment in our derivation uh, that answers that question. So here in the pink box is the last time that we wrote down a Fourier series before changing to a Fourier transform. We'd written, uh, we'd introduced a weighting function instead of the C coefficients, and the weighting function is something where you fed in a particular frequency and it told you what the weight going along with that frequency should be. But that, of course, is exactly what that scaled set of curves was. It's when we made the x-axis the frequency. So this f of k object is that curve. And the only question is, why didn't that curve change when we altered the periodicity? In other words, why doesn't this integral change when we alter the value of L, which is um, our complete cycle? The answer is, we were altering it by introducing more zero. The interesting part, the non-zero part, was that triangular tooth that stayed with a fixed width. And so, of course, this integral stayed um, the same regardless of how much zero we put either side of that fixed tooth, uh, even all the way out to the infinite limits, which, of course, is our Fourier transform. So that's why that worked. OK, new topic. Uh, the new topic is a second example that we will just use Mathematica here to um, show us the second example so that we don't have to work through it. It's actually a similar level of difficulty to derive the Fourier transform, i.e. not too bad at all. Um, and it's an exercise in the uh, questions that go along with this course to actually do that. So I, that's one of the reasons I'm not showing the actual expression. But what are we looking at? Well, our input function here is simply a function that is equal to 1, the constant 1, um, near the origin, specifically between x is minus 1 and 1, and then it drops to 0, and then it's at 0 everywhere else. Fine. So there's, there's a second Fourier transform. Very nice. Uh, what can we learn from it? Well, uh, what I'd like to do um, is to ask you this. If I tighten up the original function so that now it only goes between plus and minus a half, so I'm squishing the range of that uh, input function by a factor of 2, what do you expect will happen to the Fourier transform of it? Uh, will it uh, change its shape dramatically or will it simply stretch uh, a bit? Well, you might have said, well, it won't change dramatically because after all, what we're putting in is basically the same thing. It's a flat function that then drops down and is zero everywhere else. All we're changing is the width of that. So we might expect that our Fourier transform will keep the same character, but it will also change. Uh, it will either stretch or shrink. Which will it do? Will it stretch or will it shrink? If we narrow the input, what happens to the output, the Fourier transform? Well, let's find out. So we need to keep an eye on the bottom uh, function here so we see how it changes. And it's wider. Okay, so it is the same function, but it has twice the width. And just to confirm that that's the right trend, if we go in the other direction and make our input function, uh, let's say, 1.5, so we make our input function wider than our initial choice, we should see then that the Fourier transform becomes very narrow. Let's see. Yes. So 
that's the that's the relationship. The wider the input function, the narrower the Fourier transform. Okay, so I don't know if you guessed that or not. Um, it's a reasonable thing that you you might have guessed it. Let me go back to the one that uh, has the wide Fourier transform. Uh, it's a reasonable thing that you might have guessed uh, because the more sharply defined the input, the higher the frequencies that we would need to capture that narrow object. You might say that might be the intuition. But why am I showing this you this in particular? Um, because this is a very nice. There's a very nice meaning to this that we can immediately assign, and it comes through quantum physics. In fact. Of the famous things about quantum physics, you know, like Schrodinger's cat and all this kind of thing, there's one phrase you might already be thinking of when I tell you that um, as one thing becomes more narrowly defined, another thing becomes broader. You might that might give you a hint. So let me let me tell you what we could how we could interpret this mathematics. This would be the correct way to describe the situation if we had a, a quantum particle like an electron that was confined in a region. So imagine an electron is confined to be between here and here. It's not allowed to be out here, but it can be anywhere within this region. In fact, we might imagine we just made a measurement to confirm that. We don't know anything about this electron, except that it's not in the regions, in the forbidden region. Our measuring device might be such that it checks the electron is in the confined region, but in such a way that it's leaves it equally likely to be anywhere within that region. Well, then this function that we've drawn here, this top hat function, if you want to call it that, describes the probability of where the electron is. And in fact, it would describe the wave function of the electron. Now, uh, what is the Fourier transform of the wave function of an electron written out as a sort of distribution over space? It actually gives us the momentum distribution of the electron. The way to say it is, if we looked for exactly where the electron is, we would have to find it somewhere in this constrained region, and it would be equally likely to find it anywhere. But the more constrained the region is, if we asked the same question about the momentum, if we measured the momentum of the electron and said, okay, what is your momentum? Uh, there would be a broader and broader range that we could get. And actually that momentum would just be the square of our Fourier transform here. So let's, uh, the probability of it. So that, uh, that function now is showing us uh, the, um, the values for momentum that we might measure if we got in there and measured that electron. So that's enough waffle, but this is nothing less than the famous uncertainty principle. And this is the correct mathematics, the Fourier transform. It's the correct piece of equipment to transform between understanding something about how uh, a quantum particle uh, is spread out in space and understanding how a quantum particle's momentum is also spread out over a range of possibilities. Squeeze one, you must broaden the other. There's no way around it, uncertainty principle. All right, so we've got five minutes left and I'd just like to show you something, something fun, something sh that shows you that the Fourier transform, as, we've, as we have it now, doesn't need to be enhanced any further. It's already a powerful tool. It's fully equipped to do impressive things immediately. So I want you to witness the full power. Witness the firepower of this fully armed and operational Fourier transform. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna record some audio, but we're not gonna use audio software, that'd be too easy. We're gonna use math software. Uh, it turns out that Mathematica can record sound for us. And so let's do that, but we'll also make it kind of challenging by adding in a horrible sound that we don't want and seeing if we can sort that out using the Fourier transform. All right, so here are some instructions to Mathematica. Don't worry about uh, how they work, but it basically says to Mathematica, I want you to record something. It's ready now to record, but to make it challenging, I'm going to introduce a horrible noise from a tone generator <laughs> and then do my little audio recording. So trigger warning, if you hate horrible tones as I do, you might want to make sure you turn down your uh, headphones or whatever. Horrible, horrible sound. Fully armed and operational battle station. Phew, that was a horrible uh, sound. But now let's do the Fourier transform of it in Mathematica. Mathematica has recorded the signal strength 
uh, from the mic, which is essentially just recording the pressure variation at the surface of the microphone. Um, now, by doing the Fourier transform of that, as always, we'll be asking what are the different frequency components that make up that pressure signal? And uh, so let's find out. There we are. Now, uh, the dense region of blue that you see down in the lower left, that is my voice. All the different frequencies in my voice during that sample. The spike that you see, the very high spike there, I strongly suspect, is that horrible sound that we heard. There's another spike actually, it's exactly at double that frequency, and that will be a harmonic of the, of the, of the, of the basic one, but it's not as strong. And then we see the whole thing mirrored at what we would take to be very high frequencies. That is an artifact, I won't explain that in detail, but it's expected. It's an artifact of the fact that Mathematica doesn't really have a continuous function for the pressure variation. The mic actually just samples the pr pressure strength at a very high rate, something like uh, 44,000 times a second, and feeds those stream of individual numbers. So then uh, Mathematica has actually done something called a discrete Fourier transform that we won't talk about in detail, just related to the work we have been doing. And an artifact of that is that very high frequencies um, appear very similar to very low frequencies uh, when the high frequency uh, almost matches the sampling rate. It's, it's, it's quite interesting, but we won't talk about it now because I just want to get down to business. So the challenge, of course, is that we will edit this Fourier transform, manually change it, and then go back to the sound and see what it does. So I want to destroy these two very narrow, very tall peaks, which I suspect are the horrible sound. Let's do it. There we are, and you can see I've completely removed those two gigantic lines. And, and in fact, uh, we're now looking at a more zoomed in. You can see my voice more clearly because it's no longer dominated by those two frequencies. Now, the test is, what will it sound like? <laughs> I don't know, but hopefully it will sound a bit better. This is very, very crude, so it's not going to sound amazing. Let's see. We can get Mathematica to go back from the Fourier transform to the original sound. In fact, if you think about those expressions that we derived for the Fourier transform, um, they're so similar that you can see that if you just apply the same process a second time, you'll get back to the original function. So that what, that's what we're going to do, both with the untouched version of the uh, audio file and the hacked one, where we've altered it in the Fourier transform space and then gone back. So let's listen to them. Here's the first one, the original recording. Fully armed and operational battle station. Do I sound like that? Maybe. <laughs> okay, have we improved it? Let's do it. I'll do it one more time and then I'll play the hopefully improved one. My suspicion, and I haven't listened to this yet, is that it will we'll still be able to hear a bit of that horrible tone actually at a higher frequency because I think it will be a harmonic uh, a, a, that, that has escaped my very crude hack. Let's see if that's true. So here's the original again and I immediately play the adjusted one. Fully armed and operational battle station. Fully armed and operational battle station. Well, I think that's a success. Um, yes, the sound is still there a bit, but we've massively reduced how loud it is. And as I suspected, it's a higher frequency. I could go back five more minutes and I could clean that up completely. And here's the thing. I'm cleaning it up with math software. This isn't audio software, although I could easily get that. The audio software would do the same stuff, but it would hide it behind sliders and other things so that I don't have to think about the maths. We're using math software, and we have already seen how to dramatically change the quality of audio. I could also adjust my voice to be higher and lower, all that stuff just playing with it at the mathematical level. Okay, so uh, that's enough about uh, Fourier transforms. Uh, we'll meet them briefly again later on in the second half of the course, which starts in the next lecture and is about how we tackle some very interesting physics problems uh, all stuff about diffusion, which includes how um, materials mix, how gases spread, how stuff melts into each other, and also waves, which is an incredibly broad and important topic. We'll be tackling scenarios that we have, would have no chance to deal with if we didn't have this Fourier equipment that we, we've been learning. So I hope you'll join me for that uh, next time. Thanks.